Tonight, damning text messages from an unnamed congressman to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows that show the Republican effort to subvert the election started long before that race was even called. Now, Democrats say they plan on showing new urgency on voting rights. House Progressive Caucus Chair Pramila Jayapal joins me live. Plus, the final checks in the expanded child tax credit go out today. If Congress does nothing to extend them, millions of American families will ring in the new year without these crucial payments. I'll speak with a politician who knows what it's like to grow up in poverty, former Mayor Michael Tubbs. And an enemy deserves no mercy. I sit down with the creators of Cobra Kai to talk about the hit show that's hitting us all in their quite nostalgic places. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. It seems like every day we're learning more about the plot to undermine American democracy and to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Whether it's from the House January 6th committee's investigation into the insurrection, whether it's from new investigative reporting in the media, or whether it's from p police body camera footage of Kanye West's publicist pressuring a Georgia election official. Yeah, that happened. New and disturbing information is emerging all the time. And these details are giving us a sense of just how comprehensive and how intense the effort was to help Donald Trump stay in the White House despite losing the election. And while much of this information is shocking, it isn't surprising, or at least it shouldn't be. A reminder, this is what the then sitting president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, said in the early hours of November the 4th, not long after polls closed. It's also clear that we have won Georgia. Yeah. We, likewise, we've clearly won North Carolina. Yeah. Arizona, we have yeah. a lot of life in that. But these were friendly Trump voters, and that could be overturned. But most importantly, we're winning Pennsylvania by a tremendous yeah. amount of money. We're winning Michigan, but I'll tell you, I looked at the numbers. I said, whoa, this is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win. Donald Trump has never been good at keeping the quiet part quiet. And on election night, he seemed to make it abundantly clear that he would not be conceding. Ever. Instead, he would push the big lie. And now, despite their best efforts, a fuller picture is coming into focus of what his allies, including in Congress, were willing to do to secure him a second term by any means necessary. This week, the House voted to recommend that the Justice Department pursue criminal contempt charges against Trump's White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows. Before the former North Carolina congressman stopped cooperating with the January 6th committee, he turned over thousands of pages of materials to investigators, which means they are not privileged. So members of the committee have been sharing some of that material all week long to explain why it's so important they talk to Meadows. Here's Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin highlighting one of those exchanges a remarkable exchange last night. On November 4th, a member of this body wrote to Meadows, here's an aggressive strategy. One day after the election, why can't the states of Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and other Republican-controlled state houses declare this is BS, where conflicts and election not called that night, and just send their just send their own electors to vote and have it go to the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States. How did this text influence the planning of Mark Meadows and Donald Trump to try to destroy the lawful Electoral College majority that had been established by the people of the United States and the states for Joe Biden? That's chilling, hearing that text read out aloud in Congress. To reiterate, mere hours after Donald Trump stood at that lectern, refusing to concede when key states like Georgia and Pennsylvania hadn't even been called yet, an unidentified GOP lawmaker was writing to the White House chief of staff and suggesting a fundamentally anti-democratic authoritarian strategy in which state Republican officials would agree to send Trump their own state of electors, their own slate of electors, to the Electoral College, regardless of the will of the voters.
This wasn't a strategy to overturn an election result. It was even worse. It was a strategy to prevent the votes from counting in the first place. So yeah, I can understand why the events between that text and the violence of this day when supporters of Donald Trump attacked the Capitol is something that the January 6th committee might want to talk to Mark Meadows about. It's astounding, right? And in the years since the assault on the Capitol, Republicans have maneuvered in shifty, immoral, yet perfectly legal ways to make sure they never lose again. Trump supporters left the Capitol and went home to run for office, including by becoming the people in charge of running local elections. Republican lawmakers in 19 states and county have passed laws that make it harder for Americans to vote. And in state houses across the country right now, based on the 2020 census, they're redrawing the maps to give them disproportionate advantages in state and federal elections. It doesn't matter if there are more Democrats than Republicans in the U.S. when it comes to presidential elections. Democrats keep winning the popular vote. But it doesn't matter if the Republicans have written the rules to ensure that they will always win. This is a crisis by any definition. Things are at DEFCON 2 in the defense of American democracy. And yet still, we wait for Joe Manchin to take it seriously. I mean, I've been raising it, as you know, with every Democratic senator I've talked to on this show for months now. Why can't you bypass the filibuster one time only to get voting rights passed, the most important issue of our lifetime? So I think there's still a chance there. We can't give up. I think we'll come to the conclusion that we're going to have to do something about it because I think they share my sense of urgency that we better get these things done. At the end of the day, uh, generally what happens is that we come together. This is our moment to get that done. And it's not, a ch not, not time for us to sort of uh, be you know, shirk back and, and not have the courage to push it forward yeah. when we have this chance. And good news. Yesterday, Democrats in the Senate made a deal to bypass the filibuster to eke out a party line vote 50 to 49. Wait, wait a minute. All of those headlines are about the debt limit not voting rights legislation, because Joe Manchin and his many Republican friends across the aisle will presumably set aside the filibuster for a vote to save their stock portfolios. But letting the American Democratic experiment end? Sorry, no can do. Yesterday, Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia, home to one of the country's most restrictive new voting laws, spoke out. And yet, as we cast that vote to begin addressing the debt ceiling, this same chamber is allowing the ceiling of our democracy to crash in around us. The American people see what is happening in Arizona and in Texas and in Florida and in Wisconsin and in Iowa. And they see what is happening in Georgia. And in the face of this crisis, the question is this, has this chamber risen to the occasion to take on the issue of voting rights, which I submit is the central moral issue confronting this Congress in this moment. I would say that the Senate has not risen to the occasion. And as voting rights legislation languishes, the clock is running out. Gerrymandered voting maps are being finalized, which will cement Republican minority rule in many states for at least a decade, if not longer. And the midterms are little more than 10 months away. This is a five alarm fire. Those aren't my words, but the words of the person charged with running elections in one of the country's key battleground states, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, who adds, if people in general, leaders and citizens aren't taking this as the most important issue of our time and acting accordingly, then we may not be able to ensure democracy prevails again in 2024. Jocelyn Benson joins me now. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Five alarm fire, some might say hyperbole, Briefly break down for our viewers what's happening in Michigan specifically that's keeping you awake at night. Well, truly, uh, the fact that democracy won the day in 2020 because good people in positions of authority did the right thing and protected the vote, protected the accurate results. Uh, and now we've seen in plain sight, as you have just so deftly laid out, a concerted, multifaceted effort to undermine and prepare to undermine the next election, to basically shore up all the weak points, put people in positions that perhaps didn't make the right, quote unquote, autocratic decisions or partisan decisions in, in, 20, in 2020, replace those people with those who might in the future, and really allow our democracy to wither on the vine. I mean, this is 
the most important issue of our time and the fact that those trying to undo our democracy are not hiding their tactics, yes. but are doing them in sight, gives us an opportunity to hold them accountable, and we have to take that opportunity. They're not hiding at all, and I wonder how worried are you in a place like Michigan, a very purple state traditionally or in modern times, how worried are you about some new local voting officials not being willing to certify the actual winners of the 2022 and 2024 elections? I mean, the new Republican Wayne County canvasser, which is home to Detroit, says he would not have certified the 2020 election for Joe Biden. Yeah, I mean, that is, a, a, again, an example of the plain sight that is occur what is occurring in plain sight. We had worked in 2020 to ensure the law was followed, that those who were in charge with certifying the results fulfilled their legal to duty to do so, and we'll continue to do that. We'll run good elections, fair elections, secure elections with accurate results, and we will work to ensure those charged with certifying it at the local and state level follow their legal duty to do just that. Uh, however, noting that they have you know, indicated they might not, we're also working to ensure we've got the legal avenues in place to, again, protect our ability simply to preserve the results of the election. And the very fact that uh, people are willing to so openly talk about subverting the will of the voters it illustrates to us that really everything we saw in 2020 culminating in the tragedy at our Capitol on January 6th, that was act one. That was the beginning. That was the prelude to a much bigger battle and effort that is being waged right now and that we'll have to be prepared for in 24. Do you feel that Democrats, whether at the state level or at the national level in Congress, in the White House, are taking the Republican takeover of elections seriously enough? No, I think if they were, we would see results and action and changes. There have been no, there's yet to be real accountability or any changes and protections put in place to avoid a reoccurrence uh, of the threat we barely survived in 20. And so I'm hopeful when I mean, I'm working every day, business leaders are talking to lawmakers, sports leaders, others are talking to everyone has a stake in protecting our democracy, not just those of us running elections. Uh, so we're, we're trying to make the case. And as so many citizens have, as so many journalists have, I hope that we'll see some action. I think the bottom line is uh, we've got to be prepared uh, to work with the current state of play and, and be prepared in 24 to uh, compel uh, all citizens citizens and all leaders to do the right thing and, 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 and demand accountability if they don't. Uh, and the, the most important thing that voters and citizens can do right now is put that pressure on lawmakers in your states and at the federal level uh, to prioritize protecting your voices, your votes, our democracy, because we still have time. Yes. We still have to protect it, and we have to take advantage of the moment to do that. We still do have time, but not much time. Jocelyn Benson, many thanks for your time tonight. Appreciate it. For more, I'm joined now by Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal of, uh, of uh, Washington State, chair of the Progressive Caucus. Thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight, Congresswoman. Let me just start by asking you, what's your response to Jocelyn Benson, who is saying it's a five-alarm fire and that Democrats, your party in Congress, are not taking it seriously enough? It is a five alarm fire. And by the way, hi, Mehdi, it's great to be with you. It is a five alarm fire. And I do think that we have to push much harder. I mean, it has been frustrating. We passed these voting rights bills out of the House. We have been continuing to push, and the Progressive Caucus prioritized getting rid of the filibuster. If you may remember, we had a whole campaign around it uh, for many months of this year, and we've been continuing to educate people about how the filibuster is essentially a, a Jim Crow relic that it was and still is being used to stop progress on civil rights and voting rights. We have to understand that there are one or two senators, maybe it's a couple more, that have been resistant to reforming the filibuster and continue to put forward some myth that this is a, uh, a, a tool that helps us to be more bipartisan. I would say it's the filibuster destroys democracy. It certainly is destroying our ability to have fair voting rights. And at the end of the day, I think it actually hurts any efforts to be bipartisan, because, Mehdi, if you can't even get enough votes to bring a bill to the floor for consideration, you're not going to get three or four or five Republicans who may be interested yes. in preserving voting rights to vote with you.
One of the, uh, you mentioned rightly that, you know, there's dimension in cinemas, but there are one or two others. There are other Democrats in the Senate who quite like the filibuster, but they're kind of hiding behind uh, mansion and cinema. Uh, one of those senators who was believed to be a fan of the filibuster, Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, came out today and said he's fine with making an exception on voting rights. He knows it's not going to get through any other way. He says it's important enough, which is good to hear. Why haven't yeah. we heard stronger rhetoric on this issue of the filibuster from the president. He mentioned in passing on CNN he would, he's open to reform. Why isn't Joe Biden making the case every day, in every speech, in every interview against the filibuster? I just don't understand what the White House is thinking, is doing. Do they not think it's a five alarm fire, as Jocelyn Benson put it? What is going on there? I think there's two things. One, there are more senators coming out, and this is a testament to the movement, to people who have been prioritizing voting rights. I think Senator Warnock... Yes, but it's not a testament to Joe Biden. He hasn't been pushing this, is my question. No, I know, but I, I did want to say I think there are more than just even that one senator that you mentioned that have changed their views. So that's, that's important progress. But when it comes to President Biden, I think that there has been a reluctance to push on it because he's also trying to get people to finish the things that are in front of us. And so that has been a holdup. I don't think that those two things need to be bifurcated. Like, I don't, I think you can work on both. I think you can push for the things that need to happen right now, but you can also make it clear that voting rights is something that, um, you know, if we don't fix that, we really have no yes. democracy. Yes. And we certainly have threats to our democracy in any number of ways right now. But I do think that the president uh, does need to be stronger on this. I think he started to be in that town hall that he had when, uh, you know, he said, if I could tell you how I really feel about the filibuster, and he seemed yes. to be you know, moving to a different place. I do think that's where his heart is. I think that, um, you know, he's had a lot of things on his plate, but I think that this is an important so time for him to say, let's get this done, people, because without it, we don't have uh, we don't have a democracy. Yeah, I think Joe Biden, uh, whether it's in his heart or not, he could be doing much more in terms of an energetic campaign against us if it truly is a priority. Um, your point about not splitting these two things up is a perfect segue into my next question, because there is this argument coming, especially today, from the White House and Democratic leadership in Congress, that it's time to prioritize aggressive action on voting rights and put off the Build Back Better bill till 2022. Uh, I want to come back to Build Back Better in a moment and the delay. But for now, where is the evidence of aggressive action on voting rights? Given we're almost a year into Democratic control of both houses in Congress, both chambers of Congress and the White House, and not a single voting rights bill has been signed into law. It is a complete false choice. I tweeted about this earlier. There is no reason to pit them against each other. We need to do both. They are both urgent, and they both need to happen this year. And I think that we can do both. The, the voting rights bill requires changing the filibuster. It is a different strategy. The Build Back Better bill requires us, we have twisted ourselves into parliamentarian pretzels to get around the filibuster by using a budget reconciliation bill. And all that we need for that is all 50 senators, which we are going to get. Um, it is going to be rocky all the way till the end, don't get me wrong, but we are going to get that. There is no reason to pit one against the other. They both have to happen. So we are going to get all 50 senators, you say. That includes, of course, Joe Manchin. Uh, you were criticized by some on the left for giving up your leverage and allowing the bipartisan infrastructure framework, the BIF, to go through Congress before the Build Back Better, the BBB bill, was voted on. I want to play something you said at the time and get your reaction on the other side. Have a listen. This was a deal that was negotiated by the president himself and Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema, and that we would trust the president that he was confident that he could get 51 votes. That's what he told us in the caucus. That's what he's told me, uh, you know, directly. And we believe him. He's going to get 51 votes. We believe him. How do you feel about that today? Do you feel that Joe Biden let you down? And do you feel you got played by Joe Manchin? No and no. 
Um, we are, you know, for the weeks and the days going up to the vote in the House, everybody, every day, if I had counted, I would be, if I got a penny for every time somebody said to me, this is not going to happen. You all have given up everything. We got it done in the House. Now, I am in the same place in saying that we are getting grenades rolled at us all the time. We have to pick them up. We have to put the pin back in. And we have to continue to focus on the fact that this is going to be rocky. We can't hang our, you know, our commitment and our hopes on the words of one senator or two senators. We have to continue to work to get it done. And the vast majority of it is done. And so I was on the phone with uh, Senator Schumer today, with the White House, and I believe we will still get it done. It's going to be rocky. And we just have to continue to leave no space in the um, in the commitment to getting it done. And listen, the president's word is on the line here, and I do still believe that he is going to do what he told me and what he told our caucus and what he told the country he would do. Had we not done what we and, had done, though- And if he I doesn't, Congresswoman. Any, what was that? And if he doesn't. No, he, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. It will hurt everybody. Well, just, to, just to be clear, you're going to pass Build Back Better by December the 31st. We are going to pass Build Back Better. I hope it is by December 31st. I think it will be. Um, but we are going to get it done, and we are going to get it done very, very quickly. Almost everything is done, thanks to the Progressive Caucus holding the There's line. There's no evidence that Joe Manchin is going to vote for it. I, 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 we just have reporting today that sh says that he spoke to Joe Biden on the phone, and they are far apart. Where is your optimism coming from? Because a lot of people are looking and saying, Joe Manchin played all of you. Well, I think, you know, if you want to give him that credit now, you certainly can, but I don't know why you would. It hasn't been done. It's not finished. And we're going to get it done. And I think that people react to reporting. There's reporting all the time. And we know that Senator Manchin has not been uh, the number one supporter of the Build Back Better Act. But he made a commitment to the president. The president made a commitment to us. And I believe we're going to get it done. So I think that there's, you know, it's, it's hard because we get this reporting all the time. Things go up and down in a negotiation. I feel like I'm in deja vu because I had to say this over yes. and over again when people told us that we weren't going to get it through the House. And we got it through the House. And we got it through the House with every single, all except one Democrat voting for it, which let me tell you, Maddie, would not have happened had we not crafted the deal that we crafted, had the Progressive Caucus not I, been as strong as we were. So give us... I don't think anyone's no, questioning... I don't think anyone's questioning your achievements in the House. We're talking about the Senate, where you don't... Um, you know, you don't control Joe Manchin. That's the problem. Joe Biden doesn't control Joe Manchin. And the leverage that you had, your critics would argue, was lost when you voted for Biff. I just wonder, do you regret voting for the Biff deal now, in no. hindsight, given it's now months later no, and I, Joe Manchin I is nowhere closer to signing off on $1.75 trillion? No, I don't regret it, because I, I think our leverage was at the maximum point. And had we not done that, I think we would have actually lost... Um, even more uh, on Build Back Better. I think we would have lost votes on it. I think it would have made it very difficult to ever pass it. So I think what you have to do in these moments is you have to try and go for maximum leverage. And I think that's exactly what the Progressive Caucus did. And I believe that we're going to get it passed. Now, is it going to be every single day Joe Manchin saying something else that somebody hangs their hat on and says, this means you're not going to get it done? Unfortunately, yes, that's, <laughs> that's who the Senator Manchin is. I mean, he he has never made a secret of the fact that he doesn't, you know, I think he uh, is not the person who crafted this bill. Um, it's not his number one priority, but he made a commitment to the president. And I believe okay. we have to get it done and we will get it done. Um, you he know, will... He will change his mind, you say. Uh, I hope we can get you back on the show when he does and when that bill passes. It's a huge bill. I've made my views very clear about what an important bill it is on this show many times. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. One reason Democrats say they haven't done more to prioritize voting rights is that they're just so focused on getting the Build Back Better Act passed, as we just discussed. But as we just discussed, they haven't been able to do that either. And today, the last checks from the expanded child tax credit went out. We'll get into that next. Time flies, doesn't it? Because it's already the last day millions of families across America will receive Joe Biden's celebrated child tax credit payments. 
That's right. Unless the Senate somehow passes Biden's Build Back Better legislation by their self-imposed Christmas deadline. The advance payments expanded by the American Rescue Plan to give $3,600 for each child under six and $3,000 for children six to 17 years old. Well, that will stop. And to give you a sense of what a difference it's made across the country, one study by Columbia University found that after just one month of receiving those payments, America's monthly child poverty rate dropped from almost 16% in June to under 12 in July. That four percentage point difference meant 3 million children were lifted out of poverty. And we know those payments to 35 million families didn't even reach every eligible household. If they had, the study said, child poverty would have dropped by up to 40%. Imagine how many children across America and their families that would save. But now the child credit is in jeopardy in that same chamber that just today overwhelmingly passed a $768 billion defense bending spell, one that put $25 billion more dollars on the table for defense than Joe Biden even asked for. So while Build Back Better and its child tax credit extension stall in the Senate, Speaker Nancy Pelosi was asked today if the House would draft a separate bill from BBB just to temporarily extend the child tax credit payments. But she said the two could not be separated. Of course, we could pass that in the House. Whether we could pass it in the Senate remains to be seen. But I don't want to let anybody off the hook on the BBB to say, well, we covered that one thing, so now the pressure is off. I think that that is really important leverage in the discussion on BBB that the children and their families will suffer without that payment. We knew this would happen. We discussed on this show that it made no sense to expand the child tax credit to lift millions of families out of poverty just to put them right back in poverty next year if the credit isn't extended, because that's exactly what it's looking like right now. And it's easy to blame Republicans for not caring about the welfare of Americans, but we've also got Democrats who aren't able to rally the votes behind all their promises. One man who's hailed the tax credit as being part of the necessities for a civilized society is Michael Tubbs, a special advisor for economic mobility to California Governor Gavin Newsom. Before that, Tubbs was not only the first black mayor of Stockton, California, but also the nation's youngest mayor of a major city. And as mayor, he started an organization focused on making the child tax credit expansion permanent. He was also hailed for leading a universal basic income pilot program in his city. Michael Tubbs is now out with his first memoir, The Deeper the Roots. In it, he traces his journey from poverty to politics to help show readers how and why anti-poverty policies have failed in the U.S. Michael Tubbs, former mayor, author of Deeper the Roots, joins me now. Michael, welcome back to the show. How worried are you that the Democrats' child tax credit payments may not get extended before the deadline? Or do you think the Democrats will pull something off and pass it last second? Well, I appreciate the confidence of the congresswoman, the, the progressive leader, when she said it will get done. So I, I, I trust her. She's done a fabulous job thus far. And I think particularly with 2022 looming, it makes no sense for Democrats who want Democrats to retain control of the House and the Senate to not to allow, as you said in the intro, families to fall back into poverty. We know that these child tax credits haven't been luxuries, they've been necessities and light, lifelines for families to go back to work because now they can afford child care, to make sure their children are fed, to deal with the still ongoing economic impacts of this COVID-19 pandemic. And I think as Democrats, we really have to be very clear about what message does it send to our base, to our people, and into our party when we allow sort of children, um, those who can vote, to be the first on the chopping block when it comes time to make tough political decisions, particularly around the holidays in, that, that in the Christmas tradition, which is about the advent of a child born to save the world. And think of all the children who will be hungry and who will be poorer, who have more stress and anxious parents around Christmas time because we take away the child tax credit. That's been the vital lifeline during this year. Michael, I want to read a story from your memoir. You write about seeing your mother going to check cashing places when you were a child. And later, as mayor of Stockton, you wanted to open up more banks. You said, I was determined to find a way to increase the number of banks in South Stockton. My district was a bank desert, an area with inadequate banking services, which allowed for the proliferation of alternative financial services like payday lenders, some charging interest rates as high as 600 percent. I asked the president of the Financial Center Credit Union, the bank that my family used, to lunch one day to pick his brain. Mike, what would it take to get a bank in South Stockton? 
No one's ever asked me that before. You knew to do that because of your personal experience. And that's a reminder to me that we need more people in politics in Congress, as mayors, as governors, who have experienced what life is like on low incomes or no incomes, who have walked in the shoes of some of the most vulnerable members of our society, rather than a Congress of multimillionaires. Yeah, absolutely. But I would also say I don't want to give the multimillionaires off the hook. I think that there's a lot of things I did as mayor that had nothing to do with my personal experience because I use my personal yes. experiences as a bridge to other experiences, not as a moat. And if you're going to lead the American people, you have to be able to lead all the American people and understand fundamentally the dignity of all the American people and that people who have less money than you don't have less money because they work less, don't have less money because they're dumber, don't have less money because they're lazy. They have less money because of historical and contemporary structural forces that create poverty wages, that create limited opportunity structures. And whether you're a millionaire or the child of incarcerated parents, if you're in government, you have to be driven to solve those problems and view those people just as worthy as your people, because they are. Yes. And uh, I noticed you talked about historical and structural forces. Michael, that'll get you banned from teaching in several classrooms in several states across the country. You can't say stuff like structural racism. Uh, talking of structural racism on a related issue, and I know you talk a lot about policing and criminal justice reform, including in your book. Earlier today, Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer who was found guilty of murder and manslaughter back in April, uh, he pled guilty today to a federal charge of violating George Floyd's civil rights. Under the plea agreement, both sides agreed Chauvin should face a sentence from 20 to 25 years. And yet over a year and a half later, since the death of George Floyd, still no real criminal justice or police reform from this Congress or from this White House. Yeah, I, I think I have been very upset at sort of the type of the amount of energy spent last year on symbolic gestures, the amount of time spent talking about how things would get better, and we still have it in the qualified immunity, which is a necessity for any real police reform. And we also haven't done a good enough job of pushing back against this negative narrative, this dangerous narrative, that somehow making cops more accountable, somehow is making that making it so that everyone's treated equally under the law makes our communities less safe and are the cause of, of people robbing Neiman Marcuses and, and stealing luxury goods, which happens every year. And, and, and I think, again, as a country and as Democrats, we have to be very clear that public safety has to be for everyone, that law enforcement works for everyone, and that law enforcement is necessary but not sufficient for the safety and the type of communities we deserve, and that we have to have a true system of accountability for actions for all people, including those who, who wear a badge. So I think one of my biggest disappointments have, has been the lack of action on police reform, because we saw last year the, 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 the heart of the nation, I thought, was awakened to say, hey, we want our law yes. enforcement to work the same for everybody. Michael, last question. What keeps you hopeful? Because there's a part in the book where you write, at times the heaviness of the history, poverty and injustice surrounding me made it difficult to get out of bed in the morning, much less to enjoy the privileges of being a Stanford student abroad. When this feeling of despair was at its worst, what lifted me out was the sound of children playing. They were a reminder that there is a future that has not yet succumbed to cynicism. That was while you were in South Africa. When you look at what's happening across America today, especially the political gridlock, the polarization, the diminishing of voting rights, the right wing threats to our democracy, what keeps you hopeful? I'm hopeful because I have two beautiful kids um, who wake up every day with the confidence that they have, will have a country that sees them for who they are as brilliant humans that can contribute in any way. I am hopeful because, I mean, the fact that I'm on this show is a testament that America is not perfect, but, but there is a, some possibility in this country. And I'm hopeful because despair is a luxury. Nihilism is a luxury that when you're actually in situations that are terrible, you need hope to even wake up in the morning. And I think I'm in such a great position where I can advocate, push, do the work necessary to make hope yes. real. But hope is a necessity. And to give up is a luxury that far too many people don't have. So who are we to give up? We just have to keep fighting. We do. And the fact that you're on this show is also a testament to the fact that we have great guests on this show. Michael, always a fascinating uh, to talk to you. Thank you for sharing your story. Congratulations on the book. Appreciate your time tonight. Coming up, 
How did Congressman Scott Perry become a rising star in the Republican Party? Well, by spewing Islamophobia, endorsing conspiracy theories, and of course, trying to overturn the last election. But before we go to break, let's talk about another rising star in the party. I'll come back to Scott Perry. But remember this headline from The Onion, Carl Rittenhouse sentenced to 45 years of CPAC appearances. That would be a pretty harsh sentence. How we chuckled. Imagine spending the next four decades talking about wokeism, fear-mongering, about critical race theory, and let's be honest, complaining about the 2020 vote. Once again, though, in America in 2021, Onion headlines aren't that far off from real life. The hard-right pro-Trump group Turning Point USA says that Rittenhouse will be speaking at their conference this weekend, along with Donald Trump Jr., Lauren Boebert, and Marjorie Taylor Greene. In exchange for fatally shooting two people during a Black Lives Matter protest, Carl Rittenhouse gets a speaking slot. Soon, he could be addressing CPAC, perhaps even the Republican National Convention. How long till Congressman Kyle Rittenhouse? We'll be right back with a story about another right-wing congressman. Democrats are taking some steps, though baby ones, to fight Republican Islamophobia. The House on Tuesday passed a bill designed to combat Islamophobia worldwide. It was sponsored by Democratic lawmaker Ilhan Omar, who was recently targeted by repeated racist slurs and anti-Muslim jokes from GOP House freshman Lauren Boebert. But Republicans took last night's vote as an opportunity to not disown Islamophobia or anti-Muslim hatred, but to double and triple down on it. You think Lauren Boebert was bad with her jokes? Pennsylvania GOP Congressman Scott Perry took it to the next level. House Democrats are deflecting from the real issue confronting the House of Representatives, and that is that the maker of this bill has no business sitting on House committees, has no business in this chamber. But American taxpayers shouldn't be forced to pay terrorist organizations, organizations that the maker of this bill is affiliated with. That supposedly terrorist organization that Perry there is trying to link Ilhan Omar to is the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, a human rights and Muslim American community advocacy group that has honored Congresswoman Omar in the past and plenty of lawmakers across the aisle. Some conservatives, by taking an old court filing out of context, have tried to attach the terrorist label to that group. Full disclosure, I've spoken at CARE events too. Now, Perry's bigoted remarks were stricken from the record. But it's just another day in the life of GOP Representative Perry, a congressman who in 2018 went on Tucker Carlson's show and suggested that the Las Vegas shooting, the worst in American history, was the work of ISIS, who last year voted against a resolution to condemn QAnon, which the FBI considers a domestic terror threat. It's a free speech issue, he explained. But this year, the free speech crusader co-sponsored a GOP resolution condemning the teaching of critical race theory, trying to block it. Perry also got lots of headlines last April when he became the first sitting congressman to openly advance the racist, far-right, great replacement theory at a House hearing on immigration. For many Americans, what seems to be happening or what they believe right now is happening is uh, what appears to them is we're replacing national-born American, native-born Americans per to permanently transform the political landscape of this very nation. Charming. But let's put racism aside for a moment and focus on domestic terror. And not just his soft spot for QAnon, because Scott Perry is a central figure in the investigation into the deadly attack on the American Capitol. When the House reconvened late on January the 6th, after the deadly insurrection, after the blood had been shed, Scott Perry still had no problem blocking the certification of the vote. For what reason does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. President, sadly, but resolutely, I object to the electoral votes of my beloved Commonwealth of Pennsylvania on the grounds of multiple constitutional infractions that they were not, under all of the known circumstances, regularly given. So after an act of terror in the Capitol that was aimed at stopping the certifying of the vote, Perry then led the push to overturn the voting results in his own home state. Wait, so was he arguing that his own election as a congressman should be thrown out? Confusing, for sure. 
But Scott Perry has much more difficult questions to answer about the insurrection. Remember Jeffrey Clark? He's the Justice Department lawyer who reportedly offered Donald Trump a plan to use the DOJ to press Trump's false election claims. And all this became attorney general and who today got his January 6th deposition postponed again, citing a medical condition. You ever wonder how Clark and Trump found each other? Scott Perry is how. Congressman Perry introduced him after the 2020 election. A Senate investigation this fall also found that Perry himself pressed the DOJ to support Trump's election lies. And he put in a good word for Clark with the number two official at the Justice Department. Quote, I think Jeff Clark is great. I like that guy a lot. He's the kind of guy who could really get in there and do something about this. Yeah, do something. Scott Perry wants to talk about terrorist ties. His rhetoric his lies about election fraud helped incite an attack on the beating heart of American democracy. Because that's what 1-6 was. According to the FBI director himself, it was a domestic terror attack. But still, Perry's extremism, as well as hypocrisy on the issue and on other issues, hasn't slowed his climb in Republican circles. It's probably accelerated it. Last month, Perry was selected by his peers to chair the far-right Republican House Freedom Caucus. And why not? He's mastered the two skills every right-wing Republican needs today. Call everyone on the other side an anti-American pro-terror extremist and avoid looking into mirrors. When we come back, Cobra Kai never dies. I talked to the creators of the Netflix smash show Cobra Kai about the upcoming new season and why television reboots and upgrades are having a huge moment. I love this show and I cannot wait. 90 seconds, be back here. Strike first, strike hard, no mercy. I've always wanted to say that on television. And no, that's not the new motto of an increasingly insurrectionist, anti-democratic Republican Party. Those of us who grew up in the 1980s will know that it was the famous mantra from the Cobra Kai bad guys in the first Karate Kid movie in 1984. Now, more than 30 years later, it's not just for Gen X anymore. Thanks to the martial arts comedy drama series Cobra Kai, it's for everyone. Millennials, Gen Z, and whatever comes after that. Cobra Kai launched in 2018 on YouTube Premium and became one of the platform's most watched shows. But even then, it didn't really take off nationally and globally until Netflix picked it up in 2020. It was during a time when we were all stuck indoors during the pandemic, and people like myself... We binge watched two seasons of it and then a third over the new year. Maybe we needed that nostalgia at a time of great uncertainty in the midst of a plague and with massive political change underway. Maybe we needed to feel good about ourselves and remember a happier, more karate-filled time. Now, as we approach 2022, Cobra Kai is back with a new action-packed, fun-filled fourth season. If Johnny and I can actually work together and we win, Cobra Kai will be out of business. We gotta take things to the next level. Eagles do not respond. They swoop down and take whatever they want. First, you gotta learn how to fly. Come on, we're gonna get sued here. Uh, sue me for what? <laughs> Tighten that cord. I am a massive, massive fan of both the original movies and this TV show. So I'm very excited to say that the creators of Cobra Kai join me now. Executive producers and co-creators, Josh Heald, John Hurwitz, and Hayden Schlossberg. Thank you guys for joining me on the show tonight. I know we're only a couple of weeks away uh, from the new season. Josh, let me start with you. I am a massive, massive fan of Karate Kid. So much so that when my daughter recently got her black belt in Taekwondo, I edited an iMovie video of her getting her belt to the I am the best classic Joe Esposito song <laughs> from the movie. So that established, give us the backstory. How did you three guys, three friends, come together on this, come up with the idea of rebooting, relaunching, updating Karate Kid for the modern era with Cobra Kai and with the original cast members? It was the right time. You know, we were, we've been friends since uh, we were young. We've known each other 25 years. We all had uh, separate careers as uh, screenwriters and directors. And uh, this was kind of a moment where we were going to work together on something that was meaningful uh, to us as kids. We're all from New Jersey. We all made that Daniel LaRusso-like trek out to California. And uh, The Karate Kid was a movie that just never left us. And over the years, we talked about it. We started finding ourselves talking more about Johnny Lawrence and the Cobra Kais and, you know, what this gang of, you know, motorcycle riding 
um, you know, karate goons with their names on their jackets. You know, where did that come from? And uh, at, at some point, we, you know, we, we shifted from thinking about it as a movie to a TV series, and it just clicked. And this long form idea started, you know, pouring out of us. And uh, then it just became a matter of how can we get it? And uh, we were we were the only people asking for it at a time in which this nostalgic, you know, reboot kind of thing that started happening um, since then, um, it hadn't yet exploded yet. Um, people hadn't come knocking for all the IP. So uh, it was it was really yeah. the, the right time for this to happen. And John, Josh uh, just mentioned Johnny Lawrence. Prior to Cobra Kai coming out a few years back, there was a viral video on YouTube which made the case hilariously for why Daniel, played by Ralph Macchio, was the real villain of Karate Kid and not Johnny, played by uh, William Zabka. Did that partly inspire you to take your show in a pro-Johnny direction when it first came out in 2018? And William, who plays Johnny Lawrence, where has he been all these years? Because he is a brilliant, brilliant actor with amazing comic timing, and I had no idea. Well, the video was not something that inspired us, but it was something that made us feel confident that there is an audience out there. The truth is, we've been giant fans of William Zabka since we were children. I mean, in, in high school, Hayden and I, when we were fr uh, you know friends in high school, you know, we talk about him and not only his role in Karate Kid, but his role in all those other 80s films like Just Just One of the Guys and Back to School. So uh, he was very much on our radar for a very long time. All three of us on here, you know, early in our careers, as we were making features, we were uh, writing Billy Zapka into all of our projects. And he was even in Hot Tub Time Machine, which Josh made. So we've been tracking Zapka for a long time. We've seen the talent, you know, for, you know, 25 years now. And uh, how did this feeling that, you know, as you saw things like that video and like his appearance on How I Met Your Mother, that there were a lot of people like us that would enjoy, that love the Karate Kid, but would love to see more from Johnny Lawrence's story. And, you know, in your, when you're in his perspective, Daniel Russo, who we all grew up uh, loving as that underdog, you know, he might become the villain, at least in the eyes of Johnny. He's certainly pretty annoying in Cobra Kai compared to what I remember him uh, in Karate Kid as the uh, car dealer. Um, Hayden, this was a show that became huge on Netflix during the pandemic. I binged it during the pandemic. Do you think it made people feel warm and fuzzy and nostalgic for a better time while they were locked down and housebound? There's no question that, you know, the Karate Kid is one of those movies that makes you want to, you know, it, it's it's pumps you up. It's the ultimate, you know, underdog story, makes you feel good. And, you know, we loved it for that reason. And so we, we in, infused that in Cobra Kai. And, you know, of course, during the pandemic, everybody's binge watching stuff on Netflix. And it just happened to come out at that time where, it, it it really hit home for a lot of people. It's it's for a generation of people who grew up in the 80s and 90s. It was like their happy days, you know, except with yes. uh, a lot of body fighting. Yes, definitely. Happy, happy days. Uh, Josh, 80s and 90s reboots, you mentioned it a moment ago. They are definitely having a moment right now. We've seen revivals of shows like uh, Gilmore Girls, The Wonder Years, Saved by the Bell right here on Peacock. Uh, the cynic might say... Well, you know, it's fun, it's fine, but it's also evidence that Hollywood's just out of ideas. Why do you think these kinds of throwbacks are proving so popular? You know, I think that's the age we live in. It's, you know, there's a lot of generational things happening where parents are showing, you know, shows from their youth, their children, and people yeah. become more invested in stories that, uh, that are timeless. You know, there's a lot of uh, shows from the 80s and 90s that are still relevant if you look at it through a different lens. And I think there's a lot of head scratching going on inside Hollywood as to, you know, how do you try to ensure a hit? You know, there's there's no uh, lack of streaming platforms and material and the, you know, the the quest for eyeballs on um, on your platform. And I think if you have something that's recognizable and ties in to, uh, to somebody's youth, uh, it, it becomes something that's more possible. I think Fuller House was kind of the, you know, the, the proof positive there, yes. where you saw this show that we grew up with that all of a sudden the next generation started watching and devouring. And at some point you go, hey, what if we sort of kind of did it again and continued it and put different spins on it? 
Yeah, definitely the different spins. I mean, I wasn't expecting the kind of spins you put on this show. Um, John, how hard was it to make Cobra Kai this season? I believe next season, too, you've already done season five as well. In the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a Delta surge this year, I mean, it's a pretty close contact show. People are fighting. There are lots of kids on set. It was certainly a challenge. I mean, season four is our most ambitious season yet. It's it's big. There's so many storylines, so many characters. But, you know, we had a great team, uh, you know, with the, the uh, COVID protocols, uh, you know, everyone masked up, people wearing shields. It was a unique experience for us as directors to communicate to cast members and, and our team when they can't see our faces in a clear way. But, you know, I think as a lot of people found during this challenging time that, you know, when you get back to work and you're there doing what you typically do, you get used to the 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 adjustments that you had. And, you know, we uh, we we powered through with season four and we're on the verge of finishing season five. So it, it's been a year full of Cobra Kai for us and we can't wait for people to see the new season. Hayden, you have a whole new generation of people, including my daughter, now being introduced to these characters and their kids and wax on, wax off, and strike first, strike hard, no mercy. Was that the goal, to get like a new generation, younger people on board? I should add, when I was trying to get this segment off the ground, um, one of my younger producers, shall we say, whose name I won't take, she actually said, oh yeah, Ralph Macchio? And I was like, oh, right. you know, there's a whole generation that don't know these people, and I feel like you've reintroduced them uh, to, this, uh, to these characters and people. Yeah, you know, we knew that one of the things that made the Karate Kid work so well was it, it had a great mentor-student relationship. And so you ha it's built in with two different generations. And, you know, on our show, uh, Johnny Lawrence is kind of playing that Mr. Miyagi character, and that's why we have, you know, maybe a little bit more edgy comedy uh, than that original movie. But it still has that relationship and that heart and that entry point for both an older audience and a younger audience to get into it. And it really is that perfect perfect um, that show if, if, if you grew up lo loving the Karate Kid to watch with your kids because for a younger generation, it deals with the themes of bullying. We try to, you know, do the modern spin on it, lots of cyberbullying, lots of, you know, all, all the, the modern forms of, uh, you know, issues that, that kids today have to deal with. So there's a lot for them. But for adults, it's, it's a complete nostalgia fest. So you really, you know, different audiences, you know, enjoy different things about it. Josh, what can we expect from the new season? What's different about it? This season is a culmination of everything we've been building toward for the entire series. The, the will they or won't they of our show is all tied into Johnny and Daniel. Will they or won't they ever, you know, see past this grudge and find a way of moving on? And if they've ever had a chance, now is the chance, you know, where our story is now. They are motivated. They have a shared interest. They have a common enemy. And they both know, you know, a heck of a lot of karate between them. So, uh, the, you know, the series is really, um, this season is really delivering on the premise of the series of putting these guys in the same place at the same time with the same goal. And, uh, and I'm excited for everybody to, to see how that unravels. And John, is this going to be the, well, this is season four. You've already said you've wrapped season five. Is that it then? We're done with Cobra Kai? We're done with this nostalgia fest, as Hayden put it? We hope not. Uh, you know, we've, uh, the way we plan to, the way we're ending season five, uh, we think there's more, more story to tell. Uh, you know, we, are, we always await the, uh, the pickup from our, our, uh, our team over at Netflix. Uh, but we know there's a lot of enthusiasm there uh, internally for the show, and there's a lot of enthusiasm out in the world. We love making it, and uh, we're hoping to make some more after season five. And Hayden, I'm going to give you the last word. Tell me about the new season in the context of Karate Kid 3. For those watching at home, if you haven't seen Karate Kid 3, go watch Karate Kid 3 before Cobra Kai comes out on New Year's Eve because there's a lot of Karate Kid 3 in this new season of Cobra Kai, including the villain, right? If you know Karate Kid 3, you know that there was a new villain introduced in that movie, uh, Terry Silver, who is basically like an 80, like a Bond villain meets Gordon Gecko that, you know, was all about destroying Daniel LaRusso's life. And, and he was very, uh, you know, very hell bent on, on destroying this teenager's life. And um, we're bringing him back into the franchise. 
And we, you know, we try to do it in a modern way, in a, in a grounded way. But there's a lot, you know, this is a character that we, as children, were just like, you know, kind of scared to death of. And bringing him into I, it kind of uh, makes everything, you know, possible in a in a, I in a fun way. I can't wait scary. to see it. And I cheered, I cheered at the end of season three when I knew it was coming. Season four premieres on December 31st. Josh Shield, John Hurwitz, and Hayden Schlossberg, thank you so much for being here tonight. That does it for me tonight. I don't often get to indulge my movie fanboy side much on the show, but I enjoyed it tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. right here on The Choice from MSNBC. For now, from me, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.